Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kevin Swanepoel, president of the One Club, and... I'm Mary Warlick, uh, CEO of the One Club. I'd like to start this... Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, we, we, we're pretty psyched to be here. You know, this is uh, World of Black People, part three. And uh, I just wanna just kick off this morning by thanking the sponsors. Um, there is a, a pretty long list of sponsors, and uh, I wanna recognize everybody, so if you can just give me a bit of time here. Uh, firstly, the Omnicom Group, uh, McCann New York, the Martin Agency, Muse, Leo Burnett, Saatchi and Saatchi, Ogilvy, TB, TBWA, Shark Day, DDB, Deutsch, YNR, IPG, Carl Michael Lynch, Goodby Silverstein Partners, Euro RSCG Worldwide, Publishers, Kaplan Taylor Group, Draft FCB, Impart, Wine and Kennedy, The Marcus Graham Project, The City College of New York, and Ad Color. Please give them a round of hand. I think what you aren't all completely aware of is that without the support of these agencies and organizations, uh, one, this would never happen. Two, they're all dedicated to making a difference in this industry. They've shown this year after year coming out to support this. We are able to provide um, some travel stipends from people who travel from out of the Triborough State to get here and uh, that way we ensure the best talent you know, pitches up. Um, the other thing is, is that they provide the food and all the goodies that come with it, this great space. So if you have come here free of charge, if you've been given a travel stop, and I'd like you to go around. You know, there's these agencies, they've got little stands upstairs. They've got uh, recruiters there. They've got creatives there. Um, they're going to be reviewing books Go up and say thanks, you know, it's really a, a, a kind gesture that they've actually supported this and got you out here. Um, next, I'd like to just hand it over to Mary to just give us a, a brief intro to this event and where it came from and where we're going with it. Uh, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Um, where are all the black people um, and Asians and Native Americans and Pacific Islanders and Indians and Hispanic people? Well, many of them are here in this room. Uh, this event started was the brainchild idea of Jeff Goodby and Jimmy Smith. Um, Jimmy you'll meet later in just a few minutes. But they had this idea of correcting the lack of diversity in advertising, specifically in the creative departments. Um, we started this, it was an idea that we started during Creative Week in 2010. And it was just a panel discussion at that time, and then we decided to do a full-blown portfolio review of panels and everything. And I'd just like you to know that it took a vision to put this together. It took all the help from the sponsors, but it also took some people who really believed in the idea. And just to give you some background, we wanted to launch this last year during Advertising Week, and we went up, we wanted to hold it at the Apollo Theater. And we went up and negotiated and talked with them and went backstage and everything. They wouldn't let us put it on the marquee. They said the title, they said change the title and you can hold your event. And Jimmy and Jeff felt really passionate about this title and we did too. And so we, this is the second year that we held, we held it at the New World stage. And I think it's a really, really great venue and uh, appreciate everybody being here. Um, Kevin mentioned the sponsors tables upstairs. Um, go say hello to them, but it's also a perfect opportunity to introduce yourself and they have recruiters up there. We are actually trying to remove the talk about diversity from a panel discussion to real live job offers. We won't, we'd be really, really happy if a good percentage of people here today went away with an offer of an internship, a job offer, or uh, at least do some heavy duty networking because that's what we're here for. And later today I'm going to give you a good pitch uh, about the One Club membership because that's a way you can extend this day throughout the year uh, through 
opportunities, network opportunities, portfolio reviews exclusive for members only that the membership provides. Uh, I think that's great. my spiel All right, for so now. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hear more later. Thanks, Mary. And um, so you would have noticed the, the hashtag. It's on the board here. I know we've got uh, sort of sketchy cell phone service down here. But um, the staff have also come up with uh, a competition. So if you can get yourself in front of uh, one of the posters, where all the black people, and uh, tweet or post it on Facebook with the hashtag uh, WAATBP, um, get yourself in the picture and uh, post that with the hashtag. And Somebody's going to win some great swag. There's uh, some one show annuals. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. There's some great stuff. There's uh, the movie, if you haven't seen it, Art and Copy. That would be the Emmy winning movie, Art and Copy. <laughs> it, that'll be in the bag. You've got to see that movie. And um, yeah, so let's get that uh, social media network buzzing with uh, this hashtag. Uh, next, I'd like to bring on the, the first panel. And uh, it is really star studded. I'm super excited about it. Uh, Warren Jones, uh, please welcome Warren Jones. He's going to moderate today, and he's from Goodby. <laughs> Thanks, War Warren. Warren was a star here last year, I think. <laughs> uh, Dubbo Che, the Executive Creative Director from SparkDDB. Uh, if Dubbo's not here, he might pop in mid-panel. He's here. He's coming. Here. Excellent. He's cutting it down to the wire. When I walked on stage, he awesome. wasn't here. Yeah. Vidya Johnson, who's the CEO of Footsteps, please give her a warm welcome. Donna Lamar, who's a partner and a director of creative and development at Amusement Park Entertainment. Uh, Joe Muse, Chief Creative Officer of Muse Communications. Uh -huh. Danny Robinson, Senior Vice President, Creative Director of the Martin Agency. And one of the founders of this movement and the idea who it was, Jimmy Smith, CEO, CCO. And also, an esteemed member of the board of directors of the One Club. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And so, Warren, you'll be moderating? Yeah. OK, cool. Thank wow. you. Thank you, Mary and Kevin. Um, wow, this is really nice. I thought we were going to come out to some theme music. I was expecting Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, and 2 Chainz, but it's OK. <laughs> it's fine. Um, <laughs> well, you know, where are all the minorities at? That's the, that's the main question. And uh, like Jimmy always says, we, we, we in here. And um, <laughs> we, we, we right here today. And uh, um, like, like they said, my name is Warren Jones. Um, I'm a junior brand strategist at Goodby Silverstein Partners. And I'm honored to be here on, uh, on behalf of GSP. And uh, Jeff Goodby in particular, um, he was really instrumental in helping to create this event um, with, with, uh, with Jimmy. And um, just, did I say Jimmy or Jeff, Jeff Goodby? <laughs> no, you said it right. All right, cool. I'm making sure. All right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm delighted to be moderating a panel of such distinguished uh, leaders in our industry. And um, it's going to be really awesome. Um, but before we get started, I just want to uh, shout out the audience, you know, I mean, uh, for, for being here to support the event and, um, you know, being here to help create change and um, to, uh, to, to take the opportunity, to be wanting to get the opportunities that are hopefully that you all presented today. So just give yourselves a round of applause for being here today. Uh, so like I said, um, it's going to be a great, great session today. To my left, we have uh, some of the dopest creative minds in the industry. Uh, like Jimmy says, off the skillet, and uh, <laughs> uh, so um, they're here to shed some light on a tough topic here uh, on diversity in advertising, and um, really talk about what's working, what's not working, and um, you know what part we all can play to help keep moving things forward. So uh, with that said, uh, we're gonna get the ball rolling. Um, so if you all could just briefly. Uh, give a little personal background on how you got into the industry, uh, uh, what made you want to get into it, and how you 
kind of uh, got to where you started today. Uh, we can start with you. Okay. Um, my, I was told not to hold the microphone like this. I, my natural inclination is to get on the stage and start rapping. Um, uh, I got in the industry kind of uh, um, by accident, I think, as a lot of people did. Um, although I took some graphic design classes in high school and was obviously um, interested in the arts, uh, once I got into art school, and I went to a fine art school, School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, all right? <laughs> Representation, not to be confused with the art institutes that are all, how many times have you had to answer that question? Oh, I went there too, I, got, I drew the little bear, I got accepted. Um, um, so, <laughs> I went to School of the Art Institute and um, uh, really fell in love with filmmaking and, and uh, decided that was gonna be my passion and um, uh, decided to start a production company uh, with a bunch of classmates. Um, and was doing all kind of independent study and trying to get credit for doing my own projects, trying to get paid, it was hustling. Uh, so, uh, but once I got out of school and the production company thing wasn't really paying my salary, I was needing a way to, uh, you know, obviously pay the bills and I was doing some teaching on the side. Uh, and so I was lucky enough to have a roommate who was a graphic designer um, in advertising and he was, uh, he was just great, he just taught me so much. And um, well, as I was looking for a job, he stressed to me that um, you know, I should really think about getting into this business. Um, and it actually came, um, came up that uh, in the production department at Foot Conan Building, they were looking for a kind of one-man band production team. Um, and so it, it's kind of seemed unorthodox at the time, but um, I kind of went and applied for it, and he helped push me uh, through, and they helped try to pull me in, and I eventually got a, a job in the production department, shooting and editing and doing a lot of my own projects. Um, and then, you know, you start to, once you get in, once you're in the door, you start to realize, like, well, start to ask questions, like, well, what does this person do? And I could write an ad, that, that don't sound like, this ain't, this ain't rocket science, I could do that. Um, and so I was able to, luckily there was a new change in leadership and they were trying to turn things around at the time. And, uh, so they were very open to doing things in an unorthodox way. Uh, so I just kind of started walking into meetings um, with storyboards and, uh, and people were very confused by it. Uh, but they let it happen <laughs> for some reason. And uh, you know, I just started to fall in love with the, the, the business and the, and the challenge of it and the ability to kind of scribble something down on a napkin. Uh, and then just have the, uh, the joy and exuberance of then showing up on set and having millions of dollars kind of and, and people working and employed in and around making your idea a reality. Um, so that's, that's how I got started. Yeah. Well, I'm coming at this from a different perspective because I am co-founder and co-owner of an agency. But I have worked with um, creative, obviously, in, in, for, for a long time. Um, but I got into uh, the advertising business because I love marketing, period. And I started out in brand management, uh, worked with several companies. And then I moved into media, working as the advertising director of Black Enterprise Magazine, and then moved on to Gannett Outdoor. And then at that point, entered um, advertising. So as we go further, um, in this panel conversation, you'll hear that perspective. Um, I got into advertising probably in a more traditional way because I went to school. And um, when I was in school, um, I had an instructor who said, hey, he was my advertising, I took an advertising course and I quite liked it. And he said, yeah, you should pursue that. And um, prior to going to university, I remember really liking the stories that were told on television in these little tiny bite-sized pieces. I loved the fact that the best thing on television when I was growing up were the commercials. And so when I talked to this instructor and he said, go into advertising, I thought, sure, why not? So um, I went to graduate school and, and got a master's degree in um, communications with a specialization in broadcast advertising, which I don't even know if that exists anymore, but that's at the time. 
it existed. And um, I got out of school and I got a job at um, Saatchi and Saatchi, not knowing anything, just by the way, going to graduate school for advertising is not at all necessary and I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> just FYI, don't do that. <laughs> Go to portfolio school or something like that. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> because I had no, I, I came out of school and I didn't actually understand what it was. And um, it was all a bunch of theory and a bunch of people who had never worked in the industry who was where I learned all about organizations and how people work, which actually is quite important for advertising too, but for practical purposes, portfolio school is much better. And um, yeah, I got hired at Saatchi and Saatchi and as a coordinator, and I didn't quite understand what was going on, but it gave me an opportunity to see what all of the departments in advertising were about, and I realized that what I really wanted to do was make those little commercials, tell those little stories. So I met, um, I, I took it upon myself to go introduce myself to the head of production at Saatchi and Saatchi at the time, and I was like, I want to do what you do. And um, here's my resume, and I'm sure I was hired for the wrong job. And um, that worked, and I was really surprised. So I was a production coordinator for three months, and then I became an assistant producer, because I went and found the woman who ran the department and told her that I had the wrong job. <laughs> so, um, and then after that, I just, moved up in the industry and I was a producer. I became a head of production at Wyden and Kennedy. I worked freelance with Joe many years back and Jimmy. And um, then Jimmy, um, when I wanted to make the transition from producer to creative, he really helped in that a lot since he gave me my job as a creative. And here I am. No one's route's going to be anything like anyone else's, I'll tell you that now. Uh, the route in the business for me uh, started, the lucky part for me was that I happened to go to a school that had an advertising curriculum. And at the time, I was a biochemistry major. <laughs> so serendipitously, I got tired of biochemistry and sought out advertising, found out I liked it, and then promptly upon graduating was told by counselors that I really should have stayed in biochemistry. Because <laughs> there was no way I was gonna find a job in advertising because, get this, back in 72, they really weren't hiring black people. This is what a counselor told me, who was black at the time. <laughs> and I wasn't daunted by it. I, I thought it was peculiar that they would tell me what I couldn't do. And that generally was a great sign that that's what I should do. And I went after it, but they were right. There wasn't a whole lot happening for me, so I ended up getting a job as a sales rep. And as things developed, I had a friend who was in advertising and convinced him to hire me for nothing. And I sold advertising for him and did it well. And at some point, there were some people in, uh, it was Orange County, California, actually where Jimmy lives now. And, and um, one of the advertising guys heard about me and wanted to hire me, so he offered me a job and told me I could do whatever I wanted to do for him. Just tell him what it was I wanted to do. And I said, well, I want to run a creative department. And he gave me that job, and I had a creative department of about eight people. I wrote. We did a lot of work. It was fun. I enjoyed it. And years later, I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. And really sought out the opportunity to merge my company, I started a tiny ad agency along the way, 
with another firm, Domingo Group here in New York, and that's about when it all kind of started for me on the New York scene, particularly with the merging of the companies. So I've always done creative work and lots of other stuff, and we'll probably talk more about all that other stuff, but I'm good. Um. I was, a, I was a painter when I was, when I was a kid and was pretty good and won a lot of awards in high school and decided I was going to go to art school and my father decided that art school cost money. So I went, um, I went to Hampton because he was a professor and he could get a remission of tuition. So I went to Hampton, studied uh, to be an art teacher, went to grad school because I taught for a month and realized that was the hardest job in the world and I wasn't cut out for it. I went to graduate school and got an MBA because I thought I liked marketing, which I do, um, and worked in brand management for a couple of years and then decided I wasn't cut out for that either. So I, uh, I got a job as a copywriter at a small ad agency, promotion agency, and worked there for 12 years. I thought I was going to be there for a couple of months. Um, did a freelance job while I was there for Leo Burnett, and the president and the CEO asked at the end of this freelance job, would I like to start an agency? Um, so this is, this is the path you can all take. Just, um, <laughs> so I said yes. And um, my partner at the time of the freelance job and I started Vigilante with a uh, joint venture with Leo Burnett and did some pretty interesting work for um, Heineken and Johnny Walker and Major League Baseball. And we did the Oprah car giveaway um, and was there for seven years and wasn't looking to leave and got a call or got an email from the president of, of Martin congratulating us on some work we did and I said thank you and then he called me on the phone and said he wanted to have lunch and we had lunch and somewhere in the middle of the lunch he asked what would it take to get you here and of course that doesn't happen ever either and since I wasn't looking to leave, that was an easy answer. So I sent him a piece of paper with a really big number on it and just a list of things. And he said, OK. And then I was stuck. So, <laughs> um, so I left Vigilante. And I moved to Richmond, Virginia. And I've been at Martin for eight years. Um, and uh, love it. And I think I, I did all of this because I, I, what I say to people is try, if you're going to leave and go to something else, if you're going to move, always try to get closer to the thing you think is the perfect thing. And I think at least I have, with every step, gone from something sometimes not good to better and sometimes good to great. Um, that's my short, short story in my path. Good path. Um, this is my third one of these, right? So. I don't know if you've all been here before, but you probably heard those old school stories back in the day. So you know about mom and dad saying, have a backup plan to basketball, and um, then getting the door slammed by a whole bunch of agencies. And then my boy, Lewis Williams, and Alma Hawkins at um, Burrell hooked me up. And um, Lewis, um, Alma gave me the gig, and then um, Lewis taught me all the ABCs. So I had all you know the basic moves, fundamentals, and all that kind of stuff down but uh, so I had the basics but I didn't have any um, Harlem shuffle in my game so um, Joe Muse uh, got a little bit of Nike back in the day like what 1990 91 something like that and y'all too young to remember this cat but Chuck Yeager he was a test pilot back in the day and he used to get to fly all those dangerous planes and do a whole bunch of crazy shit so Joe let me do a whole bunch of crazy shit. So I got to break all the rules that I learned. And um, between Burrell and Muse, that's where, where my game is today. I, I couldn't have done it without that dude right there on stage. So. Um, Joe, uh, I heard you talk about uh, you know the unconventional lanes into the industry and how you know no no way in, is uh, is pretty much the same, especially for for you guys up here. So the question I have is based on your experiences, um, how important would you say is it for our audience to explore? Um, you know, trying to get to embrace exploring non-traditional ways into the industry. 
Well, first, Jimmy, you, I was a placeholder for you. You, nah. you. you were already doing what you were doing and was bound to do a lot more. Uh, but that said, I, I think the struggle that I have in answering the question has more to do with who you are and not so much to do with non-traditional or traditional. There's a tendency from what I can tell is that the people who are attracted to do this are some pretty strange people. <laughs> they're, they're not your normal get it done a certain way. I mean, Don is really not a normal person. <laughs> and I think I, I knew that when I met her and she was really good and, and I've certainly, one can look at Jimmy and know that he's not normal. <laughs> but, but it's the quality of your difference that makes all the difference in your job pursuit. How are you unique so much so that someone like Danny's gonna take a second look. You gotta get the second look before you get any look. Yeah, I remember, honest to God, what was in Jimmy Smith's portfolio. And that was 25 years ago? Yep. Now it was only two pieces. He had been in the business for maybe five years. He had two pieces in his book. And I asked him, why do you have two pieces in your book? And he said, because I like these. And they were different and they were unique and it was a strange enough opening that we had a second meeting and a third meeting. So the, the idea of non-conventional, the bad news is that you can't fake it. You can't fake the funk of being different. The ones who do that, they, you smell them when they walk through the door. You are either someone I want to do business with that's going to be unique for my clients and give me different kinds of work, or you're not. So pursue what's different about you, not so much the stuff that makes you fit into the box. Not that the stuff that makes you fit into the box isn't important. It's real important too. You know, wear pants to the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Shoes and socks are usually pretty good too. But it's the other stuff that makes the difference. And I think exercising that muscle is going to get you to a point of being noticed. Any more thoughts on that? Well, I agree. I agree with that 100%. I mean, um, I remember at um, <clears throat> when I was coming up, and you present something that had to do with um, hip hop or something, and you know the cats didn't understand it or the um, client didn't understand it. And I wasn't trying to do hip hop, I was just trying to do who I was. So it was what it was, because that's what it was, right? So whenever I got in trouble would be when I'd try and do something. Well, they try and, I didn't do it too often now, but every once in a while I said, well, they keep trying to say, do it like that, let me try and do it like that. And there would always be a huge failure. So when I zeroed in on what Joe was talking about and just doing who I am, but remember, there's going to be a, when you do who you are, because you are different, there's going to be a hard, lot of hard knocks on that. You know, I got fired a couple times, yelled at, I yelled back. But, um, <laughs> you know, you just got to be comfortable with who you are. This is what I am. This is what I do. I believe I'm good at it and just refine it. I didn't just take and say, this is who I am and not make who I was better. You definitely got to improve. But... That, that's the, that is the key, is take that spark that God gave you and go with that. Okay. Uh, staying in the same lane, Dabo, um, you've talked about how people can sometimes struggle hold their creativity uh, to try to fit into a specific mold or a box. Um, you know, can you shed some light on that? That's why that's not a good idea? Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually the other side of that same coin that Joe was talking about um, and Jimmy was talking about, that uh, oftentimes I think a lot of people are 
young people are very anxious to get into the industry and they, they want it so bad. And you know, that passion is what's gonna, it's gonna kind of see them through some of those hard times. But oftentimes I find that um, looking at uh, young people's work that sometimes they limit themselves and they try so hard to kind of do what's already been done or, or do what kind of fits the mold um, correctly. And you know, the important thing is that you, you do what we already can't do in the, in the agency, right? We're already, uh, in agency life, we're kind of constricted by clients' demands and budgets and um, producers telling us we can't do things because uh, of logistics. And, but as, as, you're, you know, as you have nothing to lose and as all you're working with is your ideas and, and some, some paper and, and uh, you know, just your, your thoughts, um, what I look for is for young people to, to show who their, what their true personality is, what their point of differentiation is, what their voice is, um, and also to, to do things that we can't do um, because it's, you can't have more of the same uh, over and over and over again. We want to see people with vision. We want to see people uh, that um, bring a unique spin to it. The advertising is always about what's, what's next, what's hot, is breaking the mold. If it's not about fitting into it. Um, what, what's most important though, what, what I feel is universal, is that uh, you are a, a salesman. And I find that to be the most useful universal tool that anybody can have. If you know how to sell ice water to an Eskimo, you would do well in this business. Um, that doesn't mean you're going to be a great creative, it doesn't mean you're going to be a great producer, it doesn't mean you're going to be a great account person, it doesn't mean you're going to be a great client. But ultimately, if you walk into a room and you're able to present something that people didn't know they wanted before you walked in but couldn't live without it after you walk out, that's, that's the true key to this business. Um, and refining your skills and, and you know, being groundbreaking uh, in how you approach business is, is fundamental as well. But uh, if there's one thing that I could say is universal is, is just really learning how to get into a room, charm the room, uh, and, and, and make a sale, make people want it. And that's what this is really all about, ultimately. I've learned since um, being in the industry that building relationships is really important and, and the, uh, the fact of networking uh, has really helped me um, open up a lot of doors. So this question is for Donna and Joe. Um, you talked about how you know, your connections along the way helped you in, in your career. And Joe, we've had a conversation about the importance of relationship building. Can you just shed some light on the importance of that and you know, how meeting new people can bring about new opportunities for you, for the audience? Um, I, relationships have actually formed the, the cornerstone of my career, basically. And I have to say, as far as networking goes, I, I, I will be the first to admit that I'm not the most outgoing person. I'm not the person that you're going to find in the party all of the time. That's not me. Um, but I am the person who will seek out the person or the knowledge or the people or the organization that have the information or have and, and when I say information, information could be as small a thing as I was interested in a particular color that one company made and I had to go find that color because I need it for whatever reason. But that is a, that's forming a relationship to me because once you start seeking out the information and then utilizing that information in a way that is going to be helpful to take you to wherever you're trying to go, whether that's a meeting or to the next level in your work or, or whatever it is that you're trying to do, then you are forming relationships. And the important thing about relationships is once they start, they don't end. You know, just because you met some, say I meet one of you here today, I might meet someone right after this today and we might share five words, and in three years or 10 years even, I might bump into you again and you'll never know what has happened in your, your career as well as my career, and we're now on a path together that can lead us both someplace else. So it's important to realize that just because you're making a connection today, it doesn't mean that it's not going to bear fruit five years from now or even tomorrow. So I'm, what I'm saying is 
networking is one thing, but relationships are the key. And relationships are things that take time to develop. So. You know, if you ever find yourself in a room and you don't want to be there, and there's some maven walking around meeting everyone and enjoying the heck out of it, follow her around. <laughs> Act like you know her, and then you might get a car that way. Call it chummy. You know, you don't you don't have to worry so much about can you do it yourself. I, I think what you have to be more concerned about, and, and this gets a little odd because if you look at the nature of what we do, uh, there's not a whole lot of agreement out there that we're any better than car salesmen in terms of credibility or likability or all that other stuff. But that aside, there's a remarkable ability for people to really be nice to each other. And good people sometimes do better than the ones who are good at something. So what I would offer is, you know, what my grandmother used to tell me, is treat people the way you want to be treated. And don't hurt nobody. Just be as clear about who they are as you are about yourself. And that comes back. That doesn't just go away. I know it looks like it does, but there's a spirit to it that comes back for you. So doing that more than getting to know people is critically important. Now, the getting to know people part. There are lots of people I know that I forget. I really don't care. I mean, it's okay to say it. The same thing happens to you. There are a lot of people you know that you don't care if you see again. <laughs> you really don't. And then when they show up, you go, oh, it's you. <laughs> and they're gone, and that's it. I mean, those are the people you don't want to be. But that happens. You want to be the person that people remember. And that requires you to connect to them, and sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Don't trip them when you don't. Just don't hurt them. Just go, <laughs> go on to the next person, and you'll connect. I promise you, connecting with people in this business is not as hard as it seems, but you will have to kiss a lot of frogs. <laughs> a lot. But don't worry about it, you'll get, you'll get over that. You'll get over it and you'll meet people, it'll make a difference, and the ones who stick it out are the ones who make it. The ones who don't, they go on and they do other things. You have to decide which one are you. Um, I'd just like to add to what he's saying, but in terms of the workplace, uh, because when I came along, uh, and again, uh, I started in brand management, but this was for agencies as well, um, there were a lot of programs for you to get to know people within the corporation. And for instance, when I, my first company was Colgate, and there was a six-month training program, and there was also a mentoring program. And so it allowed you to get around in the corporation to, to know who everybody was, to uh, talk to people, to understand the various um, areas that you could go to. And it helped you to get a jump start on uh, really being able to uh, leverage everything that, that's in the corporation and start to build those relationships internally in the corporation. Um, also, people kind of at the senior level would gravitate toward you if you were new at that time um, because um, that was the way they were taught. That basically doesn't happen anymore. You know, you don't have training programs, you don't have mentoring programs, but it's still very important for you to make sure that you are meeting people within the corporation, you understand who can help in what area, and that you're building relationships inside the corporation so that you can advance 
uh, what you do. I mean, I think I got my promotions based on just the fact that I had great relationships with people internally. I mean, I was smart, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> other than that, I think it was that I had great relationships. We used to hang out after work and I knew their family, they knew mine, you know, and that's also how you can help to move forward with, with your agenda, is to see that with someone internally and then be able to have them help you to, to carry it forward. Um, so at any rate, that doesn't exist pretty much anymore, so you have to be your own advocate in that area now, which means that you need to go at aggressively understanding who's in the, the agency and, and what relationships that you'd like. And, you know, you have to ask people to mentor you these days. They, it just doesn't come naturally sometimes, but it's work that's well done. You have to be almost entrepreneurial in that sense um, because in, in the agency business, one of the things is that sometimes you being fired has nothing to do with your performance. You lose an account in an agency. They don't need all the people. So you're laid off, you know, not laid off because you don't come back, but, you know, you are no longer with a job. So it's a lot of things that I think internally what, you know, both Don and Joe were saying need to be, you know, externally needs to be done internally to make sure that you are maximizing everything that you have in the company uh, that you may work for or uh, that you currently work for. You brought up a great point. I was actually my next question, you know, because I wanted to talk about mentorships and, uh, and training and stuff like that. And, um, you know, Danny, you always talk about the importance of, of leaders and mentors in this business. And um, for, for individuals who've already broken into the industry, you know, how do we sustain their growth and keep them encouraged to eventually become like you guys up here on the stage? Yeah, and this question probably is about an age group more than it is a race. <laughs> Our ethnicity, yeah. um, you know, millennials, 22, 35 ish. There's a whole different, and I have one at home. And I, have, I have two at home. There's a whole, well, they're not at home. There's a whole. There's a, <laughs> yeah, they're not at home, which is good. Yeah, well, you got <laughs> that will happen. Um, I think part of the part of the issue we're facing um, as mentors and leaders and people who have been in the industry in a while is we probably don't really understand the generation that we're hiring. Uh, and I say that because I see us losing a lot of people that we've brought in. And I think they're, they're part of the reason is we don't get what it is they need. We're not providing what it is they want. Uh, things like annual reviews. A 27-year-old doesn't want to hear at the end of a year how they're doing. They want, they want to know at the end of the meeting how they did. Um, they, <laughs> I think, I think there's a, a need for things like instant feedback. I think the deals that we're cutting, it's not just money anymore. Sometimes it's flexibility to work. Sometimes they want to work at the coffee shop and don't see why that's not okay uh, and why they have to be in the building every day. Um, I think part, part of what we need to do is have a better understanding of the way millennials are thinking. Um, and, and we lose them, I think, because we don't, we don't really know. And, and part of, I think for me, part of mentorship is this two-way communication. If I have to learn from the people I'm mentoring and talking to, because uh, I'm a dinosaur in this industry. Um, and for me to understand what it is they need, I have to listen. And, and that's, that's a hard thing to do. Listening takes a lot of work. Uh, so I think for us, it, it's par it part, partly is not just getting people in, but understanding why, what it is they need when they get there, what challenges them. Um, and I think they also are looking for you know, reasonable goals that are set, that they can attain, that they can point to. Um, and a lot of us are used to kind of just going to the job, doing the job, putting your nose down, and, and working. I think it's a whole different mentality and way of thinking. So for me, part of, a big part of mentorship is, is not just getting people in, but helping them stay and helping them want to be in the industry and helping them figure out what it is they want because it is different than when we came up. It's just not the same, not the same expectation or desires. Okay. Um, so in about 10 minutes, we're going to open the floor for questions. So if you all just want to get your questions ready. <laughs> Um, but this uh, question is for, for everybody. Um, in a lot of other industries, there is mention of the glass ceiling uh, when it pertains to women and minorities. Um, in your creative agencies, what do you do to ensure the glass ceiling doesn't have a stranglehold on capable uh, minorities and women? And what can other agencies do to, uh, to improve on, on that glass ceiling? Anyone? 
Spike DDB is a uh, pretty small shop. We're a boutique shop, uh, and <laughs> the people who run it are minorities and women, so I don't necessarily think <laughs> there are, uh, there is necessarily glass ceiling, but my experience in other agencies and, and general market agencies, um, I, I think a big part of the, uh, the issue is that we're very willing and and able to ask our clients to take risks, right? They're like, well, why? I don't understand why the client won't buy that. They just, they, they're too scared, right? They, they won't take a risk. It's not that much money. What do they got to lose? Um, but within agency culture, we're very uh, protective of our jobs and our situations and a lot less likely to take risks ourselves. Um, and so I, I think we have to, we have to kind of look ourselves in the mirror at times and say, are we asking clients and, and others to do things that we ourselves are not willing to do? They're, they're, not everything has to be comfortable, not everything has to be fit into a box per se. It's important that uh, we're able to, to give people chances to, to um, make people uncomfortable. I think that's a part of our job, is to not have everybody so damn comfortable all the time. Um, including our clients, I mean, it's, it's, it's also another thing, too, from just a, a client side, that f for those uh, African Americans and women and minorities on the client side, just because you're in the boat doesn't mean you're not supposed to rock it. Um, the only way we're going to make progress and the only way things ever change is when people risk their own situation, put themselves on the line, to stand up for something that they believe in or someone that they believe in, to say, hey, you know what, this person deserves it. This person is smart. This person can add a lot to what we're doing, not just because they are, um, you know, just because they're a minority or just because they're a woman or, or, or um, different by any stretch of the imagination. So um, I think we all have to be willing to take personal risk. Um, we have to ask. Uh, you know, use our relationships. You know, we talked about up here on the panel, stressing our relationships. Well, those relationships don't mean much if they're only for the betterment of ourselves. Um, we have to make sure that we use those relationships to create situations and opportunities for others, for others that we believe in. Because ultimately, that's going to come back to you anyway, right? It's, it's that old law of karma that you, you do right by others and you help others, and ultimately it will kind of come back and, and, and make your situation better and give you more opportunities. So I think all around people have to just be willing to take more risk, rock the boat, um, and get their hands uh, a little dirty. I think also, just to add to that, um, there are going to be barriers. There is no doubt about it. Uh, there are going to be barriers, and I think that it would be helpful to understand what those barriers are, and then to develop a plan around how you can at least, uh, you know, attempt to, to knock down those barriers. Um, in working with various uh, corporations, and we work with all Fortune 500 companies, uh, the larger companies, um, and one of the things that we constantly face is trying to get them to do other than um, what they understand. And, and, and that's, a, that's a real problem. Uh, because you're, you're trying to be relevant uh, in terms of, the, for, for us, the African-American market, but at the same time, you have to educate people, your clients, so that they can accept it and approve it and move forward with it. So you know those barriers exist, and so what we try to do is plan for that and to make sure that we do our, our work on, you know, who, who we're talking to and how educated in terms of what we want them to be they are, and, and what we have to bring to the table to make them feel comfortable so that we can move forward with something that is different and something that will resonate. Um, and that's a barrier. Uh, and there are other barriers within the, the agency based on your client that it would be great to research and to make sure that you have a plan to deal with it. And I'd like to add a little bit to that too, and in, in a different way. I think. There are barriers, absolutely. Um, I've been extremely lucky in my career in that I've been able to, every time there was a ceiling, I've been able to burst through that ceiling and go and do something else. And that 
is largely due to the relationships I've had and also the experiences that I've had along the way. But I think also some of that has to do with the fact that I don't let other people limit me. So, and I can't tell you what my limits are because I don't, I don't know. I mean, of course we all have them, but if you go into a situation or you go into a workplace thinking that you're going to be limited before you ever do anything, you are already limiting yourself. So there's enough already in place within organizations that you have to get over and stumble through and, you know, there's already enough in place for you to go in, to, to add to that by limiting what you think you can do or what your potential is. Just because someone says a glass, there is a glass ceiling doesn't make it so. I mean, I know that sounds very naive and, and, and sort of crazy, but it's, what I'm talking about is a way of thinking. So, I mean, when you go into some place, you have to think that your potential is whatever you make it. And then if you go into it with that intentionality and you have the work ethic behind it, because it does take a lot of work, then some kind of way things open up. You meet the right people, doors open, uh, the ceiling. I mean, things happen. Um, I guess I'd, what I'd add to that, a lot of this stuff, um, I think Donna hit it on the head. It may sound very naive and all that kind of stuff. It's um, in principle, it should work like this. And to be honest with y'all, it, it is not. You can do all these things that we're saying, and you're going to keep running into the wall, keep running into the wall, and keep running into the wall. So the way you overcome that wall, the ceiling, whatever you want to call it is, you have to be, excuse my language, you have to be a motherfucker. You have to be extremely good. This dude right here, you know, he laid back. Yeah, yeah, I did that. And then he called on. He did that because he's bad. I mean, he's dope, <laughs> right? And... Um, I mean, Joe was up here coming up, talking about multicultural, starting a multicultural agency before anybody was talking about anything. That was in 1990 or something like that. I mean, the vision that he had for that, that was um, incredible. Donna did exactly what she said. She talks about no limits. She was a producer. She calls me up on the, I called her because I want to bring her on as a producer. And she said, I don't want to do a, be a producer. I want to be a creative. But Donna, you've never created anything. And that's where that no limits thing comes from. But she pointed out, yes, I have. And she pointed out what she had done and got, and she was persistent. And next thing you know, okay, you're creative. Yeah, okay. My, you know, the Jedi mind trick or something. So, so all, you, all you guys, I mean, Jared would call and call and email and email. It was, it was no way you were going to forget him. I'm, um, I'm, Jer I'm Jared, by the way. Yeah, Jared down there. I'm warm. Um, wh wh where is um, J-Dub and um, Kentucky and Ace? Where are y'all at? Y'all around here? Stand up right quick. Yep. Okay. The bald-headed cat is Kentucky. He'll tell you his real name. Um, Ace is the other one. Those two dudes, um, Ace was an um, a intern. Uh, and he was an accountant, I mean, on the account side over at Shiat, and Kentucky was answering phones. Those dudes would keep coming into the office, keep coming in offices when I was at Shiat. Hey, you got anything for us? Got anything for us to do? I mean, they bugged the purity crap out of me with, you know. <laughs> and so they, they I, I'm just trying to say, they weren't guys who were going to take no for an answer, right? And so finally we gave them a little assignment. Okay, give, give them a little assignment and they'll bomb and they'll go away. Dudes <laughs> knocked it out of the park for Gatorade and, and we presented it to Gatorade. These were people that nobody at Shia wanted to touch. They didn't want anything to do with them. And they saw their opportunity and they, and they you know, ran through it. And then where's Jessica? Oh, there she is. You all better not do this. She already <laughs> pulled that trick. It ain't going to work again. <laughs> Jessica, last year, met her here. I mean, she had been emailing and calling and talking on the phone here. And so I came here to where all the black people. There's Jessica. She goes, hey, I'm Jessica. I was like, oh, damn, that's that girl who keeps calling me. <laughs> hey, hey how, how you doing? Like, good. And, and, you know, we talked, and she showed her book. book wasn't that good? Wasn't that good? A um, couple months later, hey, I'm moving to L.A. Oh, you got a job? No. I'm just moving. And I said, all right then. Well, that's good. When you get here, we'll introduce you to some people. 
And, you know, I send you over to Shad, I send you over to David and Goliath and have you meet some people. So she comes to the agency, no money, n nothing. Uh, it was like that Stevie Wonder song. I don't know if y'all remember Living for the City, you know. <laughs> there she is. is everything. <laughs> she, um, I, I introduced her to everybody at the agency and I just sent her over to the creative department to go hang out with those guys and, you know, pick up some things. And then when you get ready to leave, I'll give you some names of some other agencies to, um, you know, to meet. At the end, of, it was either the end of the day or the next day, Donna comes into the office with um, Bobby. Bobby's my CFO, he's here too. Um, comes in the office and Roberto's in there, he's another partner at Amusement Park. Comes in the office, so we got a new intern. I said, oh, we do, you, you met somebody you met? Yeah, you, you, you brought her over. I said, who is that? She goes, Jessica. <laughs> Again, that trick's already been played. You gotta come up with something new. But you have to be, that was, that was, and I mean this with love, because I was that way, that was brain damage for her to do that. Yeah. You know, to have no money, I'm just gonna move there, and you know, God's gonna hook it up, it'll be all right, and we'll make that happen. But that persistence of not taking no for an answer. Now hers took about a year, my, 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 fine, my big, big break, like Joe said, it took me five years. And I met a comedian who said it takes about six to 12 years to find your true voice as a comedian and where you, you're really zeroed in on what you're really good at and it starts happening. So it, it may be a quick thing, but don't be scared, don't be scared if it takes a minute to get it done. Jimmy, I know you like the mic and everything. I'm done. I know, all right, we gotta get to it. <laughs> All right, um, in the essence of time, we can only take about three questions. So if you could just, uh, if you have specific questions for the panelists, um, we're gonna choose three people from the audience. Um, I can't even see these lights all in my eye. <laughs> oh, that's, he learning already. That's what I'm talking about. Y'all better run up here. The funny, the funny thing is that dude was asleep for the first 45 minutes of this presentation, and now he wants to jump up and ask questions. <laughs> Ain't that some bullshit? Go back to sleep, man. Don't ask our names. Well, you what? Heard them. No. Actually, my name is Jose Garcia. I'm a human resources engineer, and my mission is to save the soul of corporate America. But uh, my question is for you, Mr. Shea, since you thought I was sleeping. <laughs> and uh, you said earlier, though, that about taking risks, and for a lot of us, it's a terrifying thing to do. How do we galvanize others to? you know, feel for our story and help them want to take the risk with us so that it's easier? Well, you have to hedge the bet, right? You got to show that you're smart. <laughs> you got to show that you're not going to, like, get in the building and start fires. Uh, <laughs> th that ultimately that the risk is uh, worth the reward, right? That, that, that there's potential. It's not just taking risk for risk's sake. It's doing it because it makes sense, it's the right thing to do, that the only thing that's really standing in the way of it is fear. Uh, and, and once you expose people to the, to the fact that fear is the ultimate enemy right, of anything, then suddenly there's, there's common ground to be, to be shared. So um, it's, it's being worth the risk as a person, as an individual. Are you... Uh, competent? Are you smart? Are you talented? Are you creative? Are you ambitious? Are you all the things that people want? And the only thing that's stopping it really ultimately is because, well, maybe well, we don't have anyone in this department that kind of looks like you. Or, I don't know, the client might be freaked out if, you know, you wore those pants to the meeting. Um, but ultimately, those things be start to melt away after a while if you, if you prove yourself worthy of it. Um, I know you want to get to other questions, but I'll keep it short. Hopefully, that'll do it. If, if not, take a nap. Holler at me when we get that <laughs> stuff. Exactly, you do to get your juices flowing and you know that type of stuff. 
Well, if I were to have a process, <laughs> it would go something like, um, I read a lot. I read a lot. I read a lot of different things. I mean, I, I read a lot. So once I've read something or um, if I'm trying to look for inspiration, I'll pick up a magazine, a book, or something. I'll turn on NPR. My car is tuned to NPR because there's so much fascinating information on NPR, and it makes my mind wander. But then when I actually need the idea or the thought of something to come, I go running. I'll go running. I'll, I, I move. I'll surf. Surfing is my new thing. I'll get on a surfboard. I'll do anything that gets me moving and my mind not necessarily on the thing that I'm trying to, to, to do. And so in doing that, usually the idea will come or I will get motivated to start doing something. But it's, it's a combination of um, exposing myself to a lot of things and activity, movement. One more question. Hello, um, my name is Stanley Hines. I'm a junior at Temple University. And um, pretty much um, at my school, um, I'm trying to start up like a new organization um, called Temple Black Advertising Society with my partner here, Xavier. And um, this is for um, Joe, Joe Muse. Um, if you had like any advice for us as far as like starting up um, as like a minority advertising organization at like a, at Temple University. Let me see if I understand you. Did you just say? Starting up a minority advertising association? Yeah, for advertising. At Temple? Yeah. Well, <laughs> my, my advice would be don't make it minority advertising. My advice is you, if you're interested and you've got buddies who are interested in the same thing, let's say surfing, I wouldn't start a black surfing society. <laughs> or a black woman surfing with dread society. I mean, the, the thing you're, that you're expressing, and, and I just want to be very clear about it, has got nothing to do with race, ethnicity, any of that. That who you are as a human being is communicating an interest and take the high ground in that. Now, if what you want to do is things that have tangents to issues regarding politics and social socialization and hiring and diversity, do that. But take the high ground at Temple. Be, start an advertising association and call it whatever you want. Except for minority. <laughs> exactly. Call it whatever you want. Let them decide what it is that you do, but you do the thing that touches you and touches your heart. Thank you, everyone, for being so engaged, being such a wonderful audience. Um, if you could just give our panelists another round of applause. Thank <laughs> you.